Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP, Ukraine War News Update, second part thereof for the 16th of April 2024. Sorry, I'm a little bit later today, just uh, trying to get over being a bit rough. So <clears throat> there's a lot of news to go into in this video due to what Mike Johnson has declared recently but we'll start with the military aid and equipment that has been promised or has been pledged at the moment european commission approves a 53 billion dollar reform plan for ukraine the european commission said yesterday that it approved the ukraine plan a reform and investment strategy for the next four years under the plan ukraine will receive regular and predictable support under the eu's up to 50 billion euro or 53 billion dollar ukraine facility the statement said so i believe that that's what was agreed upon recently and we had hungary uh, allowing that to to take place and then it's a case of trying to work out exactly how that is uh organized i was under the impression that ukraine were to receive five billion of that by the end of march um whether that's already been given to them, I don't know. Uh, there are different claims concerning that. And th within that, there will be military aid as well. But that is a four-year uh, plan. The Netherlands is to allocate $4.7 billion to support Ukraine until 2026. Uh, the Netherlands has allocated $4.4 billion or 4. euros, $4.7 billion to support Ukraine uh, until that moment. Um, and that's the Dutch government announcing in their spring memorandum a previous state budget plans for the upcoming year. I don't know that that's anything extra. I don't, you know, there, there's so many countries say we're going to do this and then we're going to do this for, over a longer period. It's going to include this extra money. and But that might include the already pledged stuff that we said for this next year. And obviously this is till 2026. So anyway, I think the end result that we can be sure of is that the Netherlands is doing an amazing job in supporting Ukraine. Uh, big love to them as a nation um, because they're all responsible for that. Uh, as part of the Capability Coalition drones, the Netherlands wants to contract RQ-35 Hydran drones worth 200 million euros in cooperation with Denmark and Germany for the delivery to Ukraine. Germany also intends to deliver another 211 vector drones worth about 38 million euros. So these are, we've talked about these drones before with German aid to Ukraine. These are decent enough drains um, and uh, yeah, good to see that Netherlands is on to that as well now just a, a general tweet here from no reports about a number of different things including that netherlands uh, declaration canada will begin the transfer of 450 multi-purpose sky range uh, multi-purpose sky ranger drones in the summer lithuania will allocate 3 million euros for the production of fpv drones for ukraine obviously the netherlands one and then the germany one of uh, vector um drones as well so Altogether, that drone coalition is coming together to produce an awful lot of stuff for Ukraine, and uh, that that will be very gratefully received, no doubt. Now, Ukraine themselves have allocated six billion euros for arms procurement in 2024. Uh, Ukraine's 40 billion dollar defense budget uh, for this year includes six billion for arms procurement. 40 billion sounds a lot, and six billion doesn't sound like a lot for buying stuff, but they've got to maintain an entire army with that it's going to include stuff like fuel maintenance uh probably pensions wages um compensation all sorts of stuff will come out of that larger budget strategic industries minister alexander commission uh, announced that this is a sum six billion that we have in contracts for our manufacturers primarily ukrainian ones and it is very little as our production capacity is three times greater uh, Commission said, as uh, cited by Interfax Ukraine. I don't know quite what that means. It It is very little as our production capacity is three times greater. Uh, that seems to be oxymoronic or something. Um, anyway, uh, I talked to you about how the new Neptune missiles, Neptune 360, I think, uh, missiles, the anti-ship missiles essentially, but I was talking in the last video about how they could be used to attack any number of places inside occupied Ukraine, but also 
inside Russia. Uh, Ukraine battle map here says Ukraine will increase the range of their Nechi missiles to 1,000 kilometers and increase production of Nechi missiles by 10 times. So an increase, a tenfold increase in the number they are making. And wow, they have adapted them effectively, one assumes. Now, it'd be interesting to see what kind of countermeasures they have, how how successful they have been getting through air defences, but it means that they could strike targets deep inside Russia and that would allow Ukraine to hit uh, Russian ships at a further distance and reach 59 of Russia's 99 air bases. That is insanely good. Of course, the issue with using a unitary warhead like that to hit an airfield, I mean, it sounds great, but actually, yeah, okay, you could take out the control towers, probably what you go for, but beyond that, you're not going to try and take out individual airframes with these missiles i don't think what you would like ideally is is a whole load of drones to do that or some kind of airburst or cluster munition to be able to take out many things at once otherwise you know you've got 26 airframes and you're going to have to use 26 missiles effectively and that's that's never going to happen so yeah interesting to see how they're going to use those so it's, it's like i said in my last video where the Western nations have said, right, here are some missiles, but you can't use them in Germany, or we're not going to give these to you because we're afraid of you. Sorry, not in Germany, in Russia, because we're afraid of you using them in Russia. What I think, what I speculate that Western nations have done is get together with Ukraine to help them develop their own, maybe swap technology or give them technology and say, look, we ain't going to sell you these because we don't want to escalate our own stance with Russia but have all this tech, we'll help you make these, and then in short order, you'll be able to produce these yourselves. We will help you with the uh, production of these, possibly, with getting capital into Ukraine to do that. And then you can manufacture these, fire them yourselves, and say, these are Ukrainian missiles, and we're hitting Russia, and ain't nothing to do with the West. And that is the get-out-of-jail-free card, I guess, for, for the Western nation. So I uh, I have a feeling that's probably what has happened. Unfortunately, it just takes a long time to get these things up and running uh, and to scale, uh, but that could be what we're seeing. And then to talk about, again, Ukrainian indigenous production, here we have a submarine vessel that's capable of firing torpedo rockets conceptualized by Ukrainians uh, and it's undergone tests for warfare use. The vessel is able to accommodate 10 passengers and can carry a payload of explosives. Goodness me. Um... I have a feeling they're doing this in... I mean, look at that. That's, that's massive. I have a feeling they're doing this with in conjunction with the UAE. Um, for, it's what I've read elsewhere. But that's quite incredible. Uh, we're, we're moving into... I don't know. This is Thunderbirds, you know, sci-fi uh, realms, aren't we there, with, with stuff like that. Quite incredible. Um, uh here now we have David Cameron on LBC yesterday, and I watched this whole video since it came out yesterday, uh, and I was quite fascinated by all about the sort of rhetoric he has concerning Israel and Iran. Well, that was interesting in itself, and then this part, very, uh, very interesting because he is, I think, uh, being quite evasive with regard to... I mean, the issue is that the U US together with the UK and Jordan, possibly even France, helping out a little, I don't know, but other nations, Saudi Arabia um, and other nations involved in how, though, how Israel were able to, or Israel and allies were able to shoot down those hundreds and hundreds of Shahids, ballistic and cruise missiles, right? Before they got to the Israeli border. So the question is, well, if you can do that for... Israel, why are you not doing that for Ukraine? And of course, yeah, there are there are differences here. Uh, this is David Cameron's answer. Last couple of questions. Lord Cameron, we've talked about the need and the brilliance of the IRF in shooting down <coughs> drones and missiles over Iraq and Syria. Why can't they do it over Ukraine? Well, it's a very good question. We've done more than any other country, I think, individually to help the Ukrainians. We've trained 60,000 Ukrainian also, I don't think that's true. I don't think we have done more than any other con country individually. And he says this twice. And like, we've done a lot, right, in other ways. And in other ways, like I keep saying, ways that aren't quantifiable on spreadsheets of of military aid. So like training uh, and intelligence sharing and stuff like that. But I don't know that we've done the most than any other individual country. Troops, we were the first to give them...
anti-tank weapons, long-range artillery and tanks. I think the difficulty with what you suggest is if you want to avoid a, a, an escalation in terms of a wider European war, I think the one thing you do need to avoid is NATO troops directly engaging Russian troops. That would be a danger of escalation. So I've said both here in the UK, but more importantly to all our allies around the world, is do everything you can to support Ukraine in terms of money, in terms of diplomacy, and crucially in terms of weapons. Giving them weapons to defend themselves, training their troops, those are absolutely uh, the right things to do. And we've done more of that than anyone. But, but actually putting NATO forces directly in conflict with Russian forces, I think that would be a dangerous escalation. In other words, it's a, it's a dangerous escalation, but it's not a dangerous escalation for Iran. In other words, we're more worried about that exact same scenario with Russia than we are with Iran. Why? Have Russia got a bigger army? Yeah, I suppose. Have they got more conventional war, um, equipment? I guess. I mean, it's tied up with Ukraine at the moment, but I guess. But it's not really. It's about nuclear. It's about nuclear again. And really, he's skirting around the issue, but I think it's, escalate, it's nuclear escalation and it's the nuke thing that is really the issue. Yes, there's a greater long-standing connection to Israel historically, uh, geopolitically, etc., etc., than with Ukraine. Uh, yes, we can talk about um, deals that we have with Israel and whatnot, but essentially it comes down to nukes. Well, why not shoot down unmanned drones, Lord Cameron? Um, well, we are doing everything we can to help Ukrainians shoot down unmanned drones, and that is what they've. Um, but we do it for Israel, uh, but not Ukraine. To do, well, actually, what we're doing is an interesting question. Uh, what we're doing in, 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 with respect to Israel, is filling in for the Americans um, in terms of Opshader, and then using our jets, if they can, to shoot down um, missiles and drones. But actually, they're not necessarily um, the best way of shooting down missiles and drones. Air defence systems. Uh, are actually more effective. And what Ukraine re needs right now is not um, Western planes over their skies trying to shoot things down. What they desperately want and what we need to give them uh, is more air defence systems. They particularly want the Patriot defence systems. Now, Britain doesn't have Patriots. Other European countries do. Americans do. And I think there's actually quite interesting movement at the moment of more Patriot systems being sent to Ukraine. That's what they want. That's what they need. And that's what we should get them. Uh, and this is classic politician evasion. And I would have, like, I kind of like what Cameron, I'm not a fan of Cameron at all, but I kind of like what he's doing as foreign minister at the moment. He's generally saying the right things, but he's challenged there and does a classic, like, I'm going to steer it over to here and say, well, they want Patriots, we should give them Patriots. But his argumentation was very, really poor, actually. It was like, well, we're filling in for the Americans and we're doing this and that's why our planes are there. But ideally, you want to do it by um, by air defence. Yeah, but we didn't do it by air defence. And Israel didn't have the air defence to do that. So we stepped in. So why can't we do that for Ukraine? And he goes, ideally, you want air defence um, uh, and they want patriots. So we need to get the patriots. And now we're thinking about Patriots and, and you're not answering the question of, yeah, why don't we do that for Ukraine? Which is what Nick Ferrari, and I don't like Nick Ferrari at all, but it's what he was asking very clearly. Well, OK, we, why don't we shoot down drones before they get to uh, to Ukraine in the same way that we did for Israel? Um and and they, they, you can generate answers for that. You can talk about you know in other nations' airspaces and going across there and the different things like you know Jordan. There are different ways of, of of dealing with that question, but he just he completely sidesteps it and goes to talk about uh, talk about patriot, which is not wrong, right? They do need patriots, and we should be doing everything we can to secure patriots. And interesting that many people have asked this to me, and I've answered them a few times individually. The UK don't have patriot. So when you look at all the list of European nations that have patriot, UK is not on there. And that's because we have virtually no air defence systems. We have no ground-based air defence systems of that sort. Uh, GBAD. We, we operate our air defence systems from ships. And so if we were attacked, we would have to rely on our ships and a particular missile system, forget what it's called, on, on board ships to take down um, missiles that were flying over towards us. I mean, we're in Ireland, so that's actually quite cool because they're mobile in a way of being able to get around 
uh, UK, possibly even better than uh, ground-based ones, which you have to drive to different places. But actually, with with the ship-based ones being an island, we could position them to shoot down stuff before they get over our land. So I understand strategically why we've done that. The question is whether we have enough of them. And given that you have to rely on certain ships to have those, and uh, we have a dw- we have a dwindling navy, I you can argue that we we would need some ground-based ones as well to help out or or more or more ships. Uh, but anyway, yeah. David Cameron did do a lot of evasion there, and I think there's definitely a big conversation to be had around that kind of uh, question. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba and his Norwegian counterpart Bart Aida uh, during a joint press conference confirmed that talks are ongoing to strengthen Ukrainian air defence, in particular NASAMS, so it's the joint American-Norwegian air defence system. Both parties are also looking to provide Patriot systems. Interesting, Norway are looking to get hold of a Patriot system, possibly so they can make it under licence themselves, is one of the rumours. And that would obviously be able to help the global supply of Patriot systems. Um, As part of the fighter coalition, Norway will transfer to Ukraine a, quote, significant number of F-16 aircraft, which will be equipped with the latest weapons. This was stated by Minister Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, uh, your man Bart Eder, again. According to him, this will help Ukraine strengthen its strike potential and strike behind the front line. So significant number, and I'm not sure whether that included in in conjunction with Denmark as well. Um, Yeah, so good, good news that that's been talked about. However, and I'm, I don't really know how to understand this. Uh, less good news coming from Greece. Greece is not ready to transfer F-16 to aircraft to Ukraine. Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis has confirmed. He highlighted that Greece did and will keep supporting Ukraine in the future to defend itself against brutal Russian aggression. Mitsotakis also started, stated that he believes that the Russian attack on Odessa during his visit was no coincidence but an act of intimidation. Wow. So he actually thinks, if you remember, he was in Odessa with Zelensky and there's a bomb that, that drops uh, 300 metres away from them, missile, sorry. Uh, and the idea was that that wasn't, well, the, the two theories are one, that was intended, or two, it wasn't intended, it was just going to happen. And he's now saying that he thinks it was intimidatory. Um, Greek Prime Minister, we support Ukraine, but are not ready to transfer F-16s. Quote, I'm committed to continuing support to to support Ukraine to the best of our abilities without prejudice to our ability to, to, to defend ourselves because we also live in a complicated part of the world. In other words, Turkey. Um, now, I don't know if this concerns other F-16s because they've just been talking about di- uh, divesting a number of airframes due to having a range of soon to be obsolete airframes that they need to get rid of including a number of f-16s and i was under the impression they're going to sell some f-16s to ukraine uh that's not like kind of transferring i don't know so there could be two things going on they might still be selling f-16s to ukraine there might be other ones that that they're going to keep in their possession and not offload in some way i i just don't know exactly what's going on there now talking about making big orders for munitions or or doing R&D and manufacturing munitions, in this case aircraft, uh, and the industrial military complex or military industrial complex. Uh, here, a report in the UK Defence Journal reveals e- the economic impact of the Typhoon project. So the report shows that the Eurofighter Typhoon as responsible for a GDP contribution of 90 billion euros and supporting more than 98,000 jobs around Europe. In other words, when you've just seen the European uh, military strategy come out recently that talked about wanting to buy 60% European, there are obviously exceptionally good reasons for that. You want that money to stay in Europe and that tax to be a money multiplier so that money gets spent in local communities and then the supply chains there and then sandwich makers and then energy companies and then um, whatever, you know, the tax income and all of that just re recirculates around the those localized areas and it becomes a money multiplier you if you send that that job that order outside to the us or to somewhere else then you lose that money and it doesn't become a money multiplier so it's really important for any country but european nations here to buy from within europe 
This is where it gets then quite interesting for the UK because like not being part of the EU, are we part of the EU military expenditure and programs? How do we edge ourselves in so that so that the UK industries are involved in the EU procurement. Uh, do we have to rejoin the EU, for example? Well, that that kind of that kind of argument uh, will no doubt abound. Um, Colby Badwar here talking about some breaking news. That the 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 flip side of building stuff in your own countries is sometimes you get fires in your factories. So this doesn't look good. This is one of the main. Uh, artillery production facilities in Pennsylvania, Scranton. There's a fire at Scranton Army Ammunition Plant. The Scranton plant, a government-owned contractor operated facility, is the main producer of 155mm artillery shell bodies in the US. Uh, so that is bad news there. And it makes you wonder if something nefarious has happened or it's just, just a casual smoker. Uh, frontline units say they face a severe shortage of basic equipment, such as a US-made uh, 113, the armored personnel carrier, the, and even Soviet-era BMP vehicles. So they are running low on infantry fighting vehicles and APCs to do the basic jobs like uh, uh, a medevac and so on and so forth. Dozens of servicemen from three battalions who spoke to the Kiev Independence stressed that the deficit is so critical that in their units that number three to 600 infantrymen, they only have one M113 and a BMP each, jeopardizing evacuation. We are fundraising myself. Uh, Greg Terry, Professor Gerdes, Rick the Ukrainian, we are fundraising for four um, medevac vehicles, uh, Land Rover snatches that are armoured and they will be provided with the best drone protection. Uh, please go and check out the details in the video description below and help us fundraise. We are we are doing so well. It's something like two hundred fifty thousand dollars raised so far, and just a few more to get that fourth one on the way. Uh, now to what's going on with the US um, aid package and news that, that's out of uh, of Mike Johnson's mouth effectively. Before we go there, let's give you a bit of a, um, a context. So this is Congressman Joe Courtney, Democrat, elected in 2006 to represent the 2nd Congressional District of Connecticut. Uh, please join me in thanking him for his powerful words on the House floor today. Speaker, being we yesterday. have a bill pending that came out of the Senate two months ago, a supplemental funding bill to reload for countries like Israel, to reload for countries like Ukraine who are under relentless attack by Vladimir Putin, to help Taiwan in terms of the coercion and pressure that they're feeling from the People's Republic of China. We need to pass that bill. It passed 70 to 28 in the Senate. 29. Huge lopsided majority. We can do the same here in the House tonight. And we can make sure that these attacks that are happening to countries, sovereign democracies, uh, are going to have the adequate tools to, to defend themselves. That's the role that U.S. has played in the past. We were the arsenal of democracy in World War II. Today, we can help defend our friends. It is time for Speaker Johnson to bring this measure to the floor, let the House work its will, send this bill to the president who said he will sign it tonight, and make sure that our out Speaker, we have... Absolutely. Right. So just to get the context to what I'm going to say now is the quickest way to get aid to Ukraine is to is for the House representatives to sign the bill that's already been passed through Senate. And then if that's voted on with a majority today, it will get signed by by President Joe Biden tonight. If you really want to help Ukraine the most and Israel the quickest, that's what you do. So there's an argument to say that everything coming from Mike Johnson now is a way to slow things down and is also a way to stop aid getting to Ukraine. That is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that they are is a way of getting aid to Ukraine. Uh, what do you think? So here is what um, I'm going to play you the entirety of what Mike Johnson has Just said. Just had a policy conference with all the House Republicans. Um we laid out the plan on how to finally address the uh, supplemental uh, situation. Um, there are precipitating events around the globe that we're all watching very carefully, and we know that the world is watching us to see how we react. Um, or we not. Have, uh, terrorists Seven and months. tyrants and terrible leaders around the world like Putin and Xi and, uh, and in Iran, and they're watching to see if America will stand up for its allies and in our own interest around the globe, and we will. Okay. First thing to say is he mentioned Putin. That's good. Although we are watching. Yeah, you've done a lot of watching for seven months. Not a lot of doing, particularly you, Mike Johnson. 
what I presented to the conference tonight is, is our uh, play call on this. What we'll do is, is bring to the House floor independent measures. We won't be voting on the Senate supplemental in its current form, but we will vote on each of these measures separately in four different pieces. So four different bills instead of one bill, get it passed tonight. So that is whatever you're thinking of whether this will be a good thing or a bad thing, it will be a slower thing if it passes. But the question is, is there a greater chance that it won't pass that that he's doing this? And I would say yes, because you know from the discharge petition that all but about 19 Democrats would sign the, the Senate bill because they signed it in discharge in the discharge way. And, and so if you actually just presented the Senate bill, it would definitely go through. 100% chance of that going through as quickly as possible. So what you are doing is if you're going to give basically the same kind of package in, in, in this new bill, then really all you're doing is trying to make it more difficult and slower and trying to give a greater chance that the Ukraine aid will not go through to try and appease those in your party that don't want Ukraine aid to go through. Just leave it up to your party. Don't try and appease them. Just like, here's a bill, vote on it if you like, which is kind of what he says at the end, but he's talking about those four bills. So I think this is... This is not cool. If it ends up working, it's better than nothing, definitely. Uh, or it, it might end up being two sides of a square, right? Although it will just be slower and you are communicating that you essentially are more up for a situation where Ukraine aid has a lower chance of getting through. We will vote on the Israel aid, uh, on the uh, aid to Ukraine, on the aid to the Indo-Pacific. And then another measure that has our national security priorities uh, included, and that has some of the things with regard to the uh, loan lease uh, option and the, uh, the Repo Act and, and some other sanctions on Iran and, and other measures that we've been talking about here for quite some time. We'll also allow for an amendment process on the floor so that the, uh, the regular processes and orders of the House can play out. Every member ultimately will be able to uh, vote their own conscience on all of these matters. And every So th the next problem is that he's... Uh, uh, so there are two ways of doing things. You can go for uh, a suspension bill where you suspend the rules and procedures. You say, right, we just need to expedite this. We're not going to vote on, you know, how long we're going to debate it, blah, blah, blah. Or you can you can go for the whole, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow everyone to, to go through all the rules, which means you are much more likely to get it held up by people delaying it by debating the rules of debating it <laughs> like the rules of the bill we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna before we talk about amendments we're gonna just disagree on how we're going to debate this bill now if you start seeing that with regard to the ukraine bill but not the israel bill then you know that this is just the whole setup is a way of allowing uh the ukraine bill to be held up by bad faith actors in the House of Representatives. Everyone have an opportunity to weigh in and bring the amendments that they uh, think are, are suitable. Uh, we'll follow the germaneness rules of the House, of course, and the regular rules with regard to amendments. Uh, but I think the, the final product uh, will be something that uh, everybody can uh, take confidence in because they... Final product, when? How long into the future are you talking? Got to, um, they got How many to deaths? Their district and, and vote uh, their conscience. Um, vote time in deaths. Yes, we're or equate time in debt. Have you spoken to Leader Jeffries about getting Democrat support? Do you think this will get through rules? Well, I, I do believe it'll get through rules. I wanted to present the details to my conference uh, first. Uh, I will talk with Hakeem Jeffries, my Democrat counterpart in the House, um, and I, I suspect that they will respect this process as well. That. Uh, if we put it on a rule and we let all members vote their conscience, it's equally fair to everybody in the House. And I think that's the way we all hope that the House will run, and that's how we work it. We will honor the 72-hour rule. Uh, that probably means that if we get bill text uh, sometime early tomorrow, that's the hope, that's the, um, the ambition, uh, then that probably puts us into perhaps Friday evening. Uh, we'll have to see how the clock works. But 
Uh, there's some very good ideas, very good conversation. I thought it was very fruitful and productive amongst all the House Republicans tonight, and I, I suspect and hope that the Democrats will have the same dialogue. Just had a and then they're on recess. So uh, I, I don't quite know fully what to think about this, but I, my opinion is it's suboptimal because it's just get the, de get the Senate bill through, job done. No report says US House Speaker will introduce four separate bills with aid to Israel, Ukraine, Indo-Pacific and national security. Last one will include a proposal to help pay for Ukraine aid by seizing Russian assets. The bill text, as mentioned, is expected to be released in the coming days and then 72 hour rule is applied for examination of the bill by representatives before it gets a vote. Uh, Democrats express reservation and are still pushing for the combined bill that passed Senate. Meanwhile, Ukraine, Ukraine is losing land. Ukrainians are dying. Evaluate this in number of deaths. That's your metric. Uh, yeah, so I, I think Democrats are going to be less happy than Republicans. Ukrainians will be happier if something gets passed rather than nothing. But the easiest thing is to just do the Senate Senate bill. Um, I'm not going to do that because I don't think he actually said that. Um, so Jake Bro's take on it, and I know he's he's not the biggest fan of the present uh, GOP situation. This is a political trap being laid out by Speaker Johnson. He wants military aid passed for Israel and not for Ukraine. First, the House will pass separate bills. The, then these bills will have to go back to the Senate to be voted on again. And that's a problem. Is The Senate bill's already been voted. These Each four of these will then have to be voted on separately. Now, because Israel was included on the combined bill that's been passed through Senate, your Democrat, uh, there are fewer Democrats that won't vote on Israel than there are Republicans who won't vote on Ukraine, is my guess. And so therefore, the Ukraine aid bill on its own will struggle to get through both Senate and House more than the combined bill would. And that's why, that's why he's doing it. So I think Jake Bro is right there. Um, Senate Republicans will then pass a House version to aid of aid to Israel, but then filibuster. So they'll they'll delay as much as they can using all the tactics they can, the standalone Ukraine aid bill. If Ukraine aid can't get 60 votes to end debate in the Senate, then it is dead. The last vote for aid to Ukraine with aid to Israel already had 30 senators vote against it. If Donald Trump can call and threaten 10 more Republican senators and twist their arm to join a filibuster, then a standalone aid bill to Ukraine will never pass. Or if Senate Republicans manage to amend a single thing in that bill, it will have to go back to the House to be voted on again. And Speaker Johnson could just never allow a vote to, on the amended version of the bill kick back to him. So in other words, if the bill that's agreed by the House of Representatives on Ukraine aid alone goes to the Senate, then the Senate go, yeah, we need to change this. So actually, we don't agree that this should happen in that bill. Then because they've amended it, it then has to go back to the House of Representatives to be voted on again. And Speaker Johnson could do just what he's done, which is like, oh, I'm not going to take it to the floor. And just another six, seven months, another forever or well, November comes along. Um, yes. So it had to go back to the House to be voted on again, and Speaker Johnson could kick it into long weeds. Uh, Senate Republicans, of course, could, would amend nothing in the Israel bill and make sure it didn't need another vote in the House. Biden will only get the Israel aid package sent to his desk and then have to decide if he vetoes it or not without Ukraine aid. Spoilers, he won't veto it. So this is this is going to be very interesting to see what happens. I mean, it turns out that the White House has come out officially and said we don't want separate bills. I think I think Karine Jean Pierre said that in in the press conference. So Biden's administration doesn't want separate bills. Speaker Johnson does because it's the greatest chance that a Ukraine aid won't get through. Here is the list of stuff that's uh, being uh, talked about. This this is a leaked version of the four bills um, with Ukraine getting um, 48.43 billion. But I, I don't think that is, uh, I think there could be some humanitarian aid that's missing off that that would, would otherwise be on there. There's, this is just a military component, uh, but but I, I could be wrong. Uh, otherwise, it looks like 12 billion less than the USA, uh, the supplemental aid package, um, which is obviously not cool. 
Uh, Colby Badwa says, uh, I mean, I, I could read that to you, 19.85 billion for replenishment of DOD stocks, uh, 14.8 billion to DOD ops uh, in UCOM AOR, whatever that means, 13.8 billion to USAI for Ukraine to purchase US weapons. So in other words, this the, the DOD money there is to buy stocks and then you can get presidential drawdown authority to, to take stocks out of, of their... Uh, and give them to Ukraine. So that's all part of the same kind of thing to buy, to take and replenish. Um, there's 4 billion left in. There's talk about there could be 8 billion presidential drawdown in this package that's not there. Uh, so there, there's a bit of confusion. And then 13.8 is so the US then contracts that out. You're not taking it from stockpiles, but you're buying it for Ukraine from elsewhere, from either other stockpiles or from, from industry. But then it has to be made. Quickest way is, is to get stockpiles out there. 8 million for IG. That's it. Um, investigated general is it inspector general so i think that's just overseeing making sure everything gets spent correctly and there's no dodginess and then 7.85 billion in direct aid to the ukraine government so not sure about you humanitarian aid and whatnot colby badwa says quickly drew up a new comparison chart for key the key security assistant provisions johnson's propo proposal has more than both biden's original request and the senate state bill but all three for how far short what ukraine needs if they're going to win um, so he seems to think that actually Johnson's proposal has more, but it's missing certain FMF foreign military financing. And uh, there's, yeah, different sort of numbers in different places. Make it up what you will. Um, and we'll come back to FMF foreign military financing. So this is so Ukraine battle map is how this is how they uh, evaluate it. This is what they say is the Ukraine aid bill that Johnson plans to put up. USAI means orders of military equipment for Ukraine. The amount is about the same as a Senate bill, 13.8 billion. The economic aid of 7.85 billion is similar to the Senate bill. 19.85 billion is to replenish equipment, but that does not mean the US can send 19.85 billion of military equipment to Ukraine. So that's replace the US stocks. The Senate bill had around 8 billion in presidential drawdown authority, meaning the president could directly take $8 billion worth of weapons from the US stock parts and send it to Ukraine immediately and then use the replenishment funding to replace that equipment it for the US. Currently the president has four billion in drawdown authority available and nothing for replenishment. So the reason why I think that you haven't seen that being used at the moment is because they would take it out of US stocks and there's nothing to replace it. If the Senate bills were passed and it also is for the whole year and for the whole world, not necessarily just for Ukraine and that's why there's still like 3.9 billion left in that presidential drawdown. If the Senate bill were passed it would have given the president 8 billion more in drawdown authority and the 19 billion in replenishment meaning the president could send 12 billion so that's a 4 billion of existing presidential drawdown plus another 8 billion um, of weapons directly to Ukraine and replace it with new weapons using the replenishment money. The Senate for it, so it seems like the Senate bill is preferable on that aspect. Senate foreign aid package included around 8 billion in presidential or to draw down authority for Ukraine. However, the previous Republican for, uh, Ukraine foreign aid bill by Representative Brian F Fitzpatrick. So remember, there were two discharge petitions. The Democrat one was just a carbon copy of the Senate bill, so it doesn't have to be voted on again. Then there was a, a, a Republican one that changed it all and it had to be re-voted on. It would have to be re-voted on by the Senate, but that's hardly got any signatures. Anyway, if you look at that as a kind of blueprint for what the Republicans might be trying to do, this is where, this is where it's going here. So that only had replenishment and no drawdown authority, meaning the president could send nothing directly from stockpiles and only make orders. If this new Republican bill is the same as the previous Republican bill and only includes 14 billion in USAI orders from companies and 19 billion in replenishment funding for US weapons, but that's just for the US. It is coming under Ukraine, but it's just for the US to replenish its stocks. Um, does not if it doesn't include that eight billion in drawdown authority, this will be a huge problem, and that means that that anyone that really is concerned about aid to Ukraine would want to then amend it and change it, which means that will take longer to go through. Just get the the bloody Senate one done. This is all just delaying, uh, and it I think it's suboptimal and would need to be amended if there's no clarity on that drawdown. Um, that would mean Ukraine would only get uh, $14 billion in USAI, so that's orders for military aid and not much else. 
it usually takes orders months and in some cases years to be completed. Think how long it's going to take to like build a Patriot system. So Ukraine would not receive proper assistance from the US for months if that is what the bill has. It would receive a lot less assistance overall without the drawdown authority. That means no cluster ATACMs and no cluster munitions can be sent at all. Regular ATACMs would take years to make. Air defenses, tanks and IFEs would too. These factories aren't just making equipment for Ukraine. They are making it for the US and, and many other countries. Everything would have to be made by companies and sent to Ukraine over the course of months or years. By that time, the front line may not be able to hold up if there is no presidential drawdown authority included in the new Republican bill that Speaker Johnson wants to put up. If that if it does include $8 billion or more in presidential drawdown authority, then that is great news. And it does mean it's nearly identical to the Senate foreign aid bill that passed 70 to 29. So that goes back to what I was saying. It looks like it's fairly much the same, but it all, in my opinion, as with Ukraine back on that, it all comes down to whether it includes eight billion dollars of presidential drawdown authority, because that's eight billion dollars that you can that you can take of stocks and throw that to Ukraine straight off the bat. The loan aspect is clearly a downside. If loans are just uh, for seven point eight five billion in economic aid, it's fine. However, the loans are for the economic assistance USAI and possibly the presidential drawdown authority. Then that will be really hard on Ukraine because Ukraine cannot afford to fund that large amount of equipment and win the war. They already have their economy in a terrible position and many other loans to pay off. The company would be bankrupt for a long time. There are no positives to the loan aspect over the Senate bill. The only reason the Republicans want it as a loan is because Speaker Johnson went to meet with Trump and Trump said he wanted a loan. The only way to mitigate the loan would be to use seized Russian assets to pay the loan off entirely for Ukraine and still send a large amount of equipment. Lastly, Ukraine is not getting $48 billion or $60 billion from the Senate or the House package. From the Senate package, they're getting around $30 billion to possibly $34 billion in economic and military aid, excluding FMF, so that's foreign military funding. And in the new potential House package, they are getting around $21.65 billion if presidential drawdown authority is not included. It's a really good analysis. Thank you very much for that. Right, let me know what you think because I think it is quite involved and there's an awful lot to consider. But my main my main thesis is that this is a way to slow down and gives a greater chance of it not going through to appease those who don't want aid to Ukraine. I think Speaker Johnson probably does want aid to Ukraine, but he's concerned far more about his job and what Trump thinks of him. And so it doesn't really matter what he thinks. It's what MTG, Mar Marjorie Taylor Green thinks, Matt Gates, uh, and other people, J.D. Vance putting his tuppence in, although he's a senator. Uh, just, you know, the these these people don't want aid going to Ukraine. And so Johnson's process is a is a is a much greater chance of that happening or not happening. Um Latest defence intelligence update from the UK. Russia continues to advertise and seek to recruit foreign nationals to join the Russian armed forces to fight in Ukraine. Most recent leaflet written in English requests foreigners to join a special unit in the Russian army and highlights a monthly salary of $2,200, a signing on payment of $2,000, a Russian passport, free medical treatment and training. Online recruitment adverts were distributed among uh, during the middle of the 2023, uh, specifically appealing to citizens of neighbouring countries such as Armenia and Kazakhstan with monthly salary offers of $1,973 and signing on payments of $5,140. Wow. During 2023, Russia had also been approaching Central Asian migrants within Russia. More recently, there have been reports of migrants from India and Nepal recruited and sent to fight in Ukraine. It is likely that many of those who have been recruited are not professional soldiers but migrant workers and have been coerced to fight under false pretenses or with the offer of financial incentives. The number of foreign nationals in the Russian armed forces are likely to be low and integrated into established rather than special units. Russia likely wishes to avoid further unpopular domestic mobilisation measures and with significant casualties currently estimated at 913 a day, Russia needs to continue to explore all recruitment avenues to maintain a high tempo of personnel inflow. Uh, and on top of that, Kiev Independence says, as Russian casualties mount and Mos Moscow runs low on inmates to fill its ranks with, Russia has intensified recruitment efforts, targeting foreigners in low-income countries and migrant workers to bolster its war against Ukraine. Um, temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine continue to serve Russia as a reserve for recruits into the military, says the head of Crimean Human Rights Group, Olya Skripnik. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a my damn press said so this is all kind of going to the same idea that they are they're really trying to uh, get people from elsewhere to sign up for the the armed forces and that shows that they are desperate for manpower which means that they have lost a lot of people 
Uh, according to Ukraine's bloggers, Russia is mobilizing roughly 1,000 troops per day. And this is, of course, being helped by all these different ways of recruiting from abroad, abroad or from occupied regions of Ukraine. So getting Ukrainians to fight against Ukrainians. Um, and then Chris O'Wiki has a thread here. Units from Russia's Africa Corps are reportedly being withdrawn from Africa and sent to Russia's Belgorod region. So that's where those Free Legion Russia, uh, Free Legion fighters were attacking. Russia Free Legion fighters. And we're talking about how successful was that? Are they drawing troops from elsewhere? Well, it could be a longer term um, answer to that is to draw troops back from Africa. So uh, sending them to the Belgorod region on the border with Ukraine. Its organiser, GRU Lieutenant General Andrei Averyanov, is said to be under a cloud for failing to achieve his goals in Africa. Uh, the, the Russian Telegram channel, that is a good source for Chris O'Wiki, says that preparations are being made to withdraw Africa Corps detachments and dispatch them to Belgorod, the scene of recent incursions by the Ukraine-supported Russian Volunteer Corps. The Africa Corps was created following Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin's death in 2023 as a means of taking over Wagner's operations in Africa and bringing them under the control of the Russian Ministry of Defence. It was reportedly the initiative of Lieutenant General Averyanov, the deputy head of GRU, and head of the GRU Special Serv Activity Service Military Unit 52659, who is also reportedly responsible for GRU operations across Europe. Wagner was formally supported through the GRU. However, according to the Telegram channel, quote, the Kremlin believes that Averyanov failed the Africa Corps project by not achieving the tasks assigned to him by the deadline. Averyanov, feeling that the earth is burning under his feet, is trying to give himself special meaning and importance in the process of moving Africa Corps fighters back to Russia. As the Telegram channel reports, Africa in this hot season is the Belgorod region. Um, so again... Possibly another sign that Russia is struggling to have enough troops to do what it needs to do, both on the front lines and within its borders to protect its own borders from Ukrainian or pro-Ukrainian incursions. That's enough from me. A lot of information. I need to go and soothe my throat with a good cup of tea. Take care. Speak soon.